And then, as he's recovering now, right, he sees all mm -hmm. those letters. And what's yeah. interesting is that earlier in the film, the wife said, you see all those damn letters? They're all from chicks. Why don't to throw their panties at you? You know what I mean? Which, by the way, in right. Elvis, the chicks were throwing their literal panties <laughs> at Elvis. And the one guy's like, is that a woman's undergarment I just saw? <laughs> so, right. You are listening to the Silver Screen Happy Hour. I'm your host, Chris Wiegand, along with my brother, Jerome, who is a graduate of Columbia College Chicago and a screenwriter. Uh, this is the show where we pair tasty drinks to go with a couple of movies. I'm really excited to share with you the movies uh, that we discussed and uh, have you jump into our conversation. I just wanted to give you a heads up. There was a little bit of technical difficulties we had, and thankfully, due to my uh, improving editing skills, um, I don't even know if you'll be able to tell. I don't think you'll be able to tell where it froze up and we had to cut it off and start over. Um, somewhere in the middle of the podcast, but I think it's listenable. There's a little background noise on my brother's end, but uh, it all works. I just wanted to throw that out there. But anyways, let me get the film reel going, and we'll uh, jump into the conversation. So, uh, Jerome, what uh, movies are we talking about today, and what are we going to start with? We are doing a Memphis location double feature about music. We are doing Elvis, the 2022 film that is up for a gaggle of Oscars. Um, anyone listening to this recording, the Oscars, uh, the nominations have come out, but the awards have not yet. So we're in that that sweet spot in between. And while we're while you're talking about Elvis, I'm going to pour my beer. I'm drinking Oberon, which is uh, in a Midsummer's Night Dream. Uh, Oberon is the what is it? The King of the Fairies, and we're gonna be <laughs> and we're gonna be discussing the King of Rock and Roll. So I was just grasping for straws when I was looking for a beer that we had in the house. So <laughs> I made it work. <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> 20 years ago, I could have made a joke there, but I'm not nope. going there now. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, never mind. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, the other film we're doing is the 2005 Walk the Line uh, about Johnny Cash. So, obviously, two great singers. What I found was interesting right off the bat in the beginning of both films, although it's not mentioned in Elvis at all. It's hinted, but it's not mentioned. It's mentioned in Walk the Line that they started out together. Yeah. They started out together with Sam Phillips and his recordings in, in uh, Memphis. Sun Is it a Sun Studios? or? Yeah, Sun Studios. And uh, that's kind of where they got their start. And they actually did like touring together. Yeah. And in, well, like, yeah, in Walk the Line, that was part of the movie where Elvis was in the scene, a couple of scenes or something, it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah he's yeah. actually a major part. Right, right. But they don't mention Johnny Cash at all in mm -hmm. the film Elvis. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two films we're talking about today, uh, comparing and contrasting two biopics, which you'll find in script structure is a little different, but not really as far as the stuff that we talk about a lot. Um, but we're going to start with Elvis because I got some shit I got to get off my chest. <laughs> so Hold on, I wait, am... first, wait, wait, wait. What, what are you drinking? Oh, we already yeah, talked right, about okay. what I'm drinking. So, first things so, first. <laughs> first things first. So in honor of Johnny Cash, who throughout the film they show him drinking beer, I am also sticking with beer today. But it's my regular uh, cheap-ass lightsaber <laughs> Blue light, Bud Light, rather. At least I had um, the King of Fairies to go with yes, the King of Rock. Yes, right, right. I have nothing <laughs> to go with this. My Bud Light and the tall blue can worked well with the yeah. blue lightsaber when we did Star Wars. Yeah. I don't have anything cool to tie in today. I, I was going to get a whiskey, uh, but I, I just didn't have time. I didn't have time to pick out a nice new bottle of something. So I'm just going with beer today in the uh, honor of Johnny Cash. Um, I, I guess I could pop some pills to nah. honor Johnny Cash, but it wouldn't be the same for we the gotta, recording. we got to keep this recording tight, and uh, <laughs> we start popping pills. We will go, yeah, we'll go all it, night. <laughs> it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work at all. So um, anyway, so we're going to kick it over to Elvis. Now, I am conflicted. Big time, because I'm gonna I'm gonna say 
something that people rarely say. I loved the film. I had problems with the script. Mm -hmm. Normally, if a film isn't written well, the film sucks. Yeah. But Boz Lerman, who directed it, and uh, we'll get to the writing credits in a second because that's part of the fucking problem. Um, <laughs> but Boz Lerman's, I love Boz Lerman's films. Fantastic. I loved Romeo and Juliet. Great Gatsby. Moulin Rouge. Like, he, he's a great visual filmmaker, great visual director, and he gets great performances out of his actors. Um, you know, uh, Nicole Kidman, my, the best I think I've ever seen her was Moulin Rouge. Um you know, uh, Claire Danes, as young as she was, probably Romeo and Juliet's the best movie I ever saw her in. Um, that was a great one. So he gets really good performances out of his his actors. Um, and visually, his films are amazing. Elvis, on that level, was fantastic. I think it was a great film. I don't know if it's the front runner right now for Best Picture. It's, I think it's the front runner for Best Actor. Um, so I... I know that it's the front runner in a lot of categories, and I. It, I hope it's it, not for best picture, um, because I I agree that like I so the first time I watched Elvis, I fell asleep, <laughs> and I'm wow. not you know partially though I was in my bed watching it and you know I get up at three thirty in the morning it's not hard for me to fall asleep watching a film but you know if it if it's good enough usually it'll keep my attention but. Something about the way it, it jumped around, um, I don't know. It was beautiful. I thought they did a great job with, like, the directing. It was – I thought a lot of the directing, like, with uh, cinematography and the yeah the, the media they used with uh, the screenshots and the split screen and how they did that a bunch of times was really cool. I liked it. Yeah. Yep. But... It, it, it actually gave me uh, – I had some flashbacks of Moneyball. Mm. Where Moneyball does a good example of mixing real life footage with uh, the film that they're shooting, right? Particularly uh, those that have seen the movie Moneyball, the, the climactic game at the end with the home run. It's intercut the real live TV footage from 2002 mixed in with mm -hmm. you know footage that they shot. Right. And it's done so great and it's beautiful. And there's a, a couple of shots like that. In, in Elvis, where they use the real footage of Elvis. Yeah. And they sort of intercut it in with the movie that they're shooting. I thought it was uh, a fun watch. I didn't fall asleep at all. It was entertaining. I actually thought it was it was well-paced. Uh, the editing was great. Again, visually. Um, and up until... I just saw it for the first time a few nights ago mm -hmm. to prepare for this podcast. I hadn't seen it in the theater. I regret now not seeing it in the theater. Um, but up until a few nights ago, I had pretty much penciled in, uh, Brendan Fraser for best actor in the mm. whale. Yeah. That, um, that movie but, was dark, man. But I really think Austin Butler did an amazing job, man. He had his, uh, I mean, um, the move, the shaking with the gyrating. Yeah. He had the moves down. It's not just the makeup with the hair and everything, although that was spot on, but he even had mannerisms down. You know right. what I mean? Like just the way that bottom lip would 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 pout down a little bit. He really had that Elvis shit down. Yeah. Like no, he, I think it's yeah. I think he's a strong contender for best actor. I mean, it, he was amazing. I and and this is an important part for you know a guy like Austin Butler is not a huge name, right? He will be now. Mm -hmm. um, but he's not. A, he wasn't a huge name at the time this was made. But there's one thing that he does have. Uh, is screen presence, right? And and thankfully they picked the right guy to play Elvis because if you're going to play Elvis Presley, you better damn well have screen presence, right? Right. And he does every scene that he's in, every shot, every frame that he's in, he owns the screen. Something else that I noticed with this with this guy, he so I've seen really good like young Elvis impersonators, really good old fat Elvis impersonators. But he, I thought he nailed each era really well. So like the young one, I mean, they even showed at some points where there was like flashbacks to when he was young from previous scenes in the movie. Yeah. To, to where he was at at that moment in the movie. And it's like, holy shit, he really did look uh, like a much younger guy and then a much older guy. And it was, you know, of course, yeah. makeup and everything. But the way he 
kind of carried himself and and performed and he just did such a good job it was crazy yeah you know and they do uh, uh, this is completely unrelated but i i had that same feeling when i saw brokeback mountain where uh heath ledger and jake gyllenhaal's characters age over 20 years and it, it, it's so subtle you know mm. what i mean like it's just it's a mustache here it's a couple of gray hairs there but you see them aging mm-hmm. you know what i mean on screen and Austin Butler does a great job of that. Again, a lot of it's makeup, but... Well, I didn't even it, notice it until they did the flashback. I think it was so subtle Yeah. that when they did the flashback, I was like, oh, crap. You know, these big sideburns and the little bit of weight he gained, it really... Yep. I noticed it when I saw the flashback. Yeah, so. yep, yeah. And um, particularly the ending, because they intercut a lot of the real life when he did that uh, Unchained Melody, right, yeah. on piano. yeah. What's interesting about that is they use Unchained Melody in the trailer. It's the end of the trailer, and, of course, it ends this film. And people get the idea. They hear him sing it, and they're like, oh, wow, uh, the Righteous Brothers covered an Elvis song. And it's actually the other way around. The Righteous Brothers is the, <laughs> created that song. Uh-huh. Elvis Elvis covered them. Right. Um and a little interesting tie-in to covering uh, when we get to walk the line, you'd be uh, amazed to know how much Johnny Cash actually covered other people's songs too. Yeah. Um, but um, so anyway, so so the film itself was enjoyable for me. I won't throw anything at the TV if it wins Best Picture. I don't have a particular favorite. You remember, uh, I haven't seen them all yet. Mm-hmm. But you know, you know me. Anyone that's listening to this podcast will tell you there's always that one film that I love that nobody else does that I think should win, and it doesn't. It right. never does. It rarely does. I shouldn't say never. It rarely does. I don't know what my favorite film was from last year. I mm-hmm. really don't. I think I was most moved by The Whale, but I don't know. You know, I can't say that there's that one that I'm, you know, I didn't have a midsummer this year. Yeah. You know, I didn't have a a, a, a a Birdman or a Silence of the Lambs. I didn't have one of those this year where it's I'm just like, I'm all in on this movie. And then this is the movie that, you know, is better than everything else. I don't care mm-hmm. what you show me. I didn't have that yet. Now, I haven't seen them all, but. I wouldn't be mad right now if Elvis wins. It was a fun movie for me. It was it was very well done. But now let me get to the script, which is why we're here, <laughs> which is what we like to talk about. Now, I'll give you guys a dead giveaway. <sighs> if you know that a script is in trouble, you have to look no further than the credits. Mm. Okay, and what's odd about this is that director is one of the writers. So you would think you would think that Baz Luhrmann's script, like he would tell the studio, this is the movie I'm making. But no, apparently. All right. So here's how the here's how the credits lay out. It's it's an unbelievable uh, seven credits over five people. Oh, my God. Um, Describe that four people, four people. Maybe six or seven credits, two, four, seven. I don't know. We'll do the math in a minute. <laughs> so Jeremy Donor and Boslerman wrote the original script. Like they're the ones that wrote the script, right? Mm-hmm. Taking whatever um, adaptations from book. I don't even think it was based on a book. I think they just they just wrote a screenplay, mm-hmm. right? And so they write the script. They get story by credit. So when you get story by credit, that means that the script was then changed again, mm-hmm. right? And, and here's the funny part. So it's story by Boslerman, the director, and Jeremy Donor. Then the screenplay credits are Boslerman and Sam Bromwell and Boslerman and Greg Pierce mm. and <laughs> Jeffrey Domer again, or wow. Jeremy, Don- J- J- Jeremy Donor again, which means that the original script that they had. They then changed it. They brought in, he brought in another writer, which means the studio was like, we're not happy, bring in another writer. So he brings in another writer. They do another rewrite. Enough to where the, uh, one, the Sam Bronwell gets SAG credit, or SAG, WGA credit, right? As a union. I get credit on screen. Fine. They're not happy with that either. Mm-hmm. So the studio comes back and says, nah, this sucks. Give me another rewrite. 
this is the fucking director, by the way. But you would think at some point he would say, look, this is my film, damn it. Yeah, right. But they're like, no, 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 no. We, we need more rewrites. So then Craig Pierce comes in and they rewrite it again. Do you think Do you think that was studio influence? The studio, it has to the be. studio is looking at with the, the, the uh, what do you call it? The, the dailies going, it, uh. <laughs> well, I don't know if it got, if they did all this shit during the shoot. That's even worse if they did. Right. Because that, that's a, that's a clear cut. This is a disaster film when you're bringing writers in while you're shooting. Right. <sighs> Well, they had think, so much money wrapped into this with the the names that were so well, not all the names, but there were some big names. There were some there were some uh, recognizable actors that were in this yes. movie. So, yes, but I I think that all this stuff was being hashed out in pre production. Like mm. that they, I don't, I wouldn't take Boz Lerman as somebody that would try to write a movie as he's shooting it. Yeah. He's he's so much more talented than that. He's a way better filmmaker than that. He's not a rookie. That's a novice move. That is a novice move and I wouldn't I wouldn't think and if that happened <laughs> that people that are listening like oh, <laughs> it was a real shit show. He doesn't really know. But uh, <laughs> I'd like to think if you know, please message us. Please email yeah. us. We'd if love you to were on this set or if you're Boslerman himself, <laughs> write us and say you would not believe what the studio made me do while I was shooting this fucking thing. But anyway, so if that's the case, I gotta say he did an amazing job with he it. He did. Well, again, the finished product is is a great film. It's right. really fun. Um, so despite the screenwriting mishaps, and again, if anyone's like, well, tell us what screenwriting mishaps. Okay, so uh, having all these writers, here's the problem: whose story is it? Well, yeah, I texted you and asked you, is it yeah. that Tom Hanks is the lead in a it's, movie about Elvis? Right. <laughs> uh, and and again, and I text you back saying, that would be fine if it was his story from start to finish. Right, But right. So like, like three quarters in or two thirds in, it stops being about Parker <laughs> and it's all in on Elvis. And it's like, wait a sec. And and then there's a few scenes with Parker, yeah. but it's really not about him at some point. It just stops being about him. Yeah. And he's narrating and the thing it, for yeah, God's sake. And sakes. then it starts being about him later again. Yeah, and then the end it's and like, then the ending is all Elvis, except for one shot of Parker dying. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, just in case you forgot who the lead was, we'll throw in a shot of the guy dying. <laughs> but the whole ending is about Elvis. It's yeah. like all right, so whose fucking story is this? Right. I mean, I mean, I, I would think that it's an Elvis story. So, uh, so you know, uh, when you look think about screenwriting structure, you think, okay, so uh, it, if Parker is the lead, then what are his tangible and spiritual goals that we always talk about? What is it he wants and what is it he learns like what does he learn on this journey because he doesn't learn a goddamn thing he no. doesn't learn a thing right like to the day he dies he keeps saying in the narration i did nothing wrong i in didn't fact, steal any money there's from a him. lot about him that's still a mystery right because they, they elude yeah but they do not close the deal right right absolutely right? actually i was re-watching it today with our mom and dad and um Mostly mom, dad just kind of walked in and started talking about it. He watched it on, on an airplane, I think, going to see you um, but, or coming mom home from seeing you. Right. Mom hadn't seen it. Mom hadn't seen it. But, um, but yeah, there. my dad was like, or dad, <laughs> my dad. <laughs> Your dad? Who's dad? My dad? Okay. <laughs> dad, dad I, I guess I was talking to the audience. Um, he said something like, like there were like rumors that maybe he was uh, what was his name? Um, they called him the Colonel, Colonel Parker, uh, Colonel Parker, um, yeah. who controlled Elvis's life basically. Uh, yeah, his Tom, professional Tom, life. Tom Parker was his name. They called him Colonel. Yeah. And, and at some point, at some point, I'm sorry, that's cut you off real quick. But at yeah. some point near the end, Elvis starts referring to him as Admiral. Like he got fucking promoted somehow from, <laughs> well, from Colonel was, to Admiral. He was annoyed with him, I think, because he even called him <laughs> Colonel Sanders at one time. <laughs> but OK, go ahead. Go ahead. So you're talking to mom and dad. So, about yeah, it. dad, dad mentioned. And I don't know if this was like popular rumor in pop culture at the time, because I had never really paid attention to this story growing up. I just knew Elvis, the icon. 
and I didn't really know any of the backstory about his manager and stuff, but dad said uh something like uh you know there's there's speculation that maybe he was a nazi or something during during the war or maybe a nazi sympathizer because there's a lot of mystery about where he was really from he had that accent that Mm -hmm. and and it came out in the movie that he didn't have proper papers to travel uh in and out of the united states and he claimed he was from the states yeah but he didn't he couldn't prove it and, and so, he had an accent. And he had an accent, so he wasn't born here. What? So it was a, a lot of – so I, I would like to actually just go down a rabbit hole at some point and, you know, look into that. But it wasn't – discuss. it wasn't it, – you're right, though. In the movie, they didn't close it. They didn't – Right, right. You know. They set it up. Yeah. They allude to all this shit, and then they don't close the deal. Right. And um, here, just for the listeners. Oh, that was for me, too. Yeah, that was good. Um, so, so there's that problem, um, and like I said, about I want to say around uh, halfway through, right now. So again, if you start talking about tangible spiritual goals, I tend to think it's Elvis, hmm. right? Because he's the one that really goes on a journey. Parker doesn't, but Parker's narrating the whole thing. Yeah. So you think, well, then it's his story, but it's really Elvis's story, right? I mean, come on, it's a biopic about Elvis. It's called it's not a, Elvis. <laughs> right. It's it's not called Parker. It's not called the Colonel. It's not a biopic about Tom Parker. Right. right. It's a biopic about Elvis. And sure enough, it has so many opportunities to be that movie. Right. We know when they start, um, when they show him as a child, and he goes to that gospel revival tent, yeah. you know, and he starts doing the shaking and everything. Yeah. And, and I went back and looked at it again the uh, last night because I was looking to see what the uh, preacher said to him. Mm-hmm. Because remember, we look for that that theme, right, in the first five minutes or whatever. And I was hoping somebody said something along the lines. Uh, the best I could make out was the the preacher says a kid tries to grab him and pull him back. And the preacher stops him and says, uh, he's got the spirit. Right. Or something like that. Yeah. So so if you look at what I mean, if you look at the whole film, what is it really saying? What is the journey that Elvis goes through? What is his biggest obstacle? Right? Mm-hmm. His biggest obstacle, to me anyway, over a damn near three hour film is that so many people try to keep him from being who he really was, right? right? They didn't want him gyrating. They didn't right. want him shaking his his ass and his legs and all that. Yeah. Right? That it was the Satan Satan himself coming through rock and roll. Yeah. Um, Race you know. played a huge theme in the movie. I mean... Uh, 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 of course, yeah. obviously, yeah, right? Obviously. Like, he, yeah, he's well, coming I from... Was, it's funny, because just watching it with mom, I was like, man, it really just letting it sink, sink in. Everyone knows this, that, you know, Elvis was the bridge that brought us rock and roll from the blues, um, from the, you know, black music culture. He, he bridged it because... Yeah. And, and I'm like, it's, it, it's... I think I even said this to mom. It's funny watching this on this side of history... The, the idea that it was such a scandalous thing right. for white people to listen to black music, exactly. quote unquote. And, and I'm and like, because I grew up with rock and roll, which right. is heavily influenced by black, you know, blues music. Yeah. I mean, it, we wouldn't have rock and roll with, but without even the look blues. At, but even look at R&B today. Like, white people listening to black music isn't a thing anymore. Or, I mean, it isn't scandalous. Well, you yeah. Know, it, is, it isn't a big deal. All white people listen to black music, right? You know, so it's like it's not it's it, it's it's so common now for artists to just be artists. It doesn't matter what the color of their skin is. But back then, oh my gosh, yeah, Elvis singing black gospel music and bringing it to white kids terrified the shit out of white America. They were like, "What? No, no!" It, it, what, you know what I mean? And like, this movie were... did a great job, like capturing that. Right, yes. capturing the horror on these white conservative and parents to, and stuff. To a point, well, there's two things. There's a two prong effect. One of it for the men, it was racism. Right, it right, was. Right. They're trying to make us listen to black music. For the women, it was. <laughs> I feel the devil in me. And even Tom Parker <laughs> says at one point, he goes, "I knew I had a hit when I saw that girl's eyes. Yeah. She would have eaten him alive. He was the forbidden fruit." He actually says those words. Right. He was the forbidden fruit. Yeah. So, and you, and they show that girl, and yeah. she's freaking out. <laughs> 
Yeah. She's like, I was like, oh my gosh. They, yeah, she's just man. losing it at this concert. <laughs> and it wasn't even a concert. They were in like a, somebody's gym or something. I, like it wasn't even that big of an amphitheater. I think she might have climaxed. <laughs> yeah, I think she did. And that was the whole point. He was like, I knew then I had my meal ticket. And that's because he just got out there and started gyrating and shaking his ass. And these girls lost their minds. Yeah. So for the women, and particularly the fathers of these women, it was Satan is coming out in rock and roll. Yep. And they're making our kids do sexual things, right? Like, Here we go. He's loud. bringing he's bringing sex out, and it was a, that that was the big deal for them. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll stop so that happens. Sorry, I poured that one a little heavy. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, King of the fairies, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to choke on this. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that King of the Fairies is thick. I can mm. see it from here. Yeah, That's thick. Honestly, Oberon, one of my favorite summer beers, and I'm drinking it in the winter. There you go. So, uh, so let me get back to poor Elvis. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, again, if you were going with any sort of a screenwriting structure, it's got to be from Elvis's point of view. Yeah. Unfortunately, the movie's narrated by Parker, so you don't really know who the hell's story it is, mm-hmm. right? But it's but if you follow sort of that three act structure, uh, the rise, the fall, the redemption, and you know the turning points, it, it's it's obvious to me the first turning point is when they're on, I want to say the Ferris wheel, mm-hmm. and and uh, and Parker pitches him to be full time, right? Like he right. was only supposed to go down to Florida for four days. Uh, to check out the touring. He's still with Sam Phillips at this point. They only mention it, but they don't mention Johnny Cash at all. But he's part of that touring company, right? right. Uh, on that Ferris wheel, Parker convinces him, come with me full time. And we will leave all this crap. We will leave this this carnival shit that I got going on. You leave Sam Phillips and we'll go off together and, and I mean, the very next scene is a montage where he signs with RCA Records. Right. He buys the house at Graceland. You know what I mean? Like all that. And you know, like, OK, we're now in act two because act two is supposed to be the flip side of act one. Mm. Act one, he was just a guy, right, playing music. And and now here we are in act two. And now he's 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 big shit now. Right. Yeah. Um, and the midpoint scene uh, he becomes a Hollywood star, which mm-hmm. he says th- several times throughout the film, this is all I ever wanted, right? So as you near the midpoint scene, he joins the army, mm-hmm. right? And uh, his mother dies. Yep. And Priscilla comes into the picture. So when all those things culminate, and then right when he gets out of the army, Parker has him signed up for some Hollywood films, mm-hmm. right? And that's when he says, that's all I ever wanted was to be a Hollywood star. So he gets what he wants right. at the midpoint scene, which is what we always say happens to the lead on their journey. Right, right? so it switched to Elvis being the lead. <laughs> right, so now Elvis is the lead, which, again, I think Elvis is the lead the whole time, yeah. but they're lying to yeah. me. The way they wrote it just sucked. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and again, we always say the second part of Act 2, everything starts to go to shit. Some bad things start happening. Uh, Martin Luther King is killed. Yep. Right. Um, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, Ken- yeah, Bobby Kennedy is killed. Um, it, uh, there's a there's a great scene, though, where he realizes that uh, Parker's not taking him anywhere now. Right. So he recruits those guys. He's on the Hollywood sign. Remember, he's sitting yeah. on the Hollywood sign and he recruits those other dudes to try to save his his career. And they do that the Christmas special. Yeah. Right. Well, and and it, hold on. Once again, the when, when uh, Martin Luther King Jr. died and Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, um, I remember a part where um, his manager was just trying to be like, "Okay, let's you know, let's move on." And yeah, let's do the Elvis, Christmas special. And Elvis was like, "We got to respond to this." I mean, yeah. And he's like, "Well, this isn't about you." And he's like, "It's all about me." It's you know, it's about because right. race has had played such a. It happened. It happened in Memphis. You know, Martin yeah. Luther King yep. uh, being assassinated in Memphis. Um, you know, and yeah. So it was. I thought they played all that really well. The way yeah. they did that. Uh, yeah. So Elvis defies his manager. He comes out and he does the protest song. Yeah. Right. Um, 
And then, you know, Priscilla tries to get him to leave, Parker. Yeah. And what does he do? <laughs> he gets conned into staying with Parker <laughs> and signing that huge deal with the International, the new casino, hotel, whatever. Um, and it's just, it's like, it's it's obvious that that this is his story because as you get to the end of this act two and you approach the all is lost, which is to me, it's a combination of, you know, uh, Priscilla leaves him, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, that's the, the main thing. Um, and then the other guy tells uh, Elvis the truth about Parker, that he might be a Nazi sympathizer. He right. might be a Nazi. He passes out in the hallway because he's like the one guy I looked at my whole life to carry me through this might be the worst guy. <laughs> Yeah, in the world, and yeah. And he's taking all my money. So obviously everything goes to shit. And then, um, but then he stays on with him. Yeah. And again, this is to me is a writing flaw because they built it up like he's supposed to learn something on this journey. Right. And for Elvis to turn around and hug it out with this guy and say, yeah, let, let's stay together. Yeah. Like, what? I know it, it either makes Elvis to be like a, a very weak person, right. you know, or... Or stupid, or, or stupid. Or stupid, and, and I think probably, uh, what's the, the colonel, what's his name? Um, Tom Parker. Tom Parker. I think he was a master manipulator. So, True. So, you know, and but they but, but the, the way they played it, it, it just kind of made Elvis look weak. Well, and again, they, they fucked up how... The structure was. Now, again, if you yeah. wanted to make it Tom Parker's story, fine. But then in the voiceovers, he keeps saying, I did nothing wrong. Right. Right? right. I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> I was just his manager. Mm-hmm. If you really wanted to play that up, you could have played it to where he was like, and I got him to come back to me, and I got him to do this, and I got him to do that. He didn't want to do that stupid hound dog thing with the tuxedo, but I made him do it. You know what I mean? You could have made him the villain from day one. Right, right. Right, and 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 him be that master manipulator, but instead they, they, they portrayed him like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. I was okay. I was the manager. You, he even says at the beginning, what's he say in the first half hour? Or I don't know where it was. You wouldn't have Elvis Presley if it wasn't for me. Well, right? like like you said, though, I mean, if they would have just made it about the colonel, made a movie about the colonel and had Elvis sort of, you know, the support for that story. Because um, the, the way the movie started, I wrote down, I mean, it starts with the colonel, what, having nightmares and saying... Um, that they they think the colonel killed Elvis, right? They think I killed Elvis. He said, right, and right. that's how it started. It it yeah, you know that was the opening scene of the movie with him, and yeah. so anyways, the, the 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 parts of that movie that moved me the most is the kid at the beginning when he's in the gospel revival tent, yeah, and then how that translates to him on stage, yeah, yeah, as an adult. Those yeah. are the funnest parts of the movie, right? You know. And to me, it gets killed with all this shitty writing yeah. mixed in with with Parker. And I get Parker's a major part of the story, but they, it's almost like they couldn't figure out what story they wanted to tell. Right. Right. So uh, I don't even know if it's one of the Oscar nominations for a screenplay. I would hope not. Right. Right. Um, but who the hell knows at this point? There's a couple of actors I know that a couple of my kids would definitely enjoy if they hadn't seen it. Um, I know my daughter Caitlin would love to know that Yola plays a uh, part in this movie. She's a a modern uh, blues singer, um, African. Well, she's not African American. I think she's British, but she's black um, blues singer. I discovered her on like NPR or something. I I couldn't believe this woman's voice, and I I turned Caitlin on to her. But uh, she she has a few few uh, great scenes where she's singing. Um, and then the guy that played Billy in Stranger Things, he's he's in it. Not a huge role, but I, I recognized him. He was the long-haired uh, brother in one of the Stranger Things uh, se- uh, seasons. Well, well, who was he in Elvis? So I remember he was, like, in the studio, and I can't remember his, his uh, name, uh, what his role was. So I think he was... Okay. Um, I don't know. He might have been uh, behind the, the behind the glass while they were recording or something. But gotcha. Yeah. So uh, Elvis has got eight Oscar nominations, and I want to say I, I I can support all eight of them. All right. So here we go. So we talked about uh, it's up for Best Picture, right? We know that it's it's one of the best films of the year. It's nominated. 
Uh, best achievement in makeup and hairstyling, right? We can mm-hmm. accept that, right? We're good with that. Best sound, we're good with that. Best performance by an actor in a leading role, Austin Butler. Obviously, we're all in, right? We, we can accept that. Um, best achievement in cinematography, right? Yes, okay, we got that. Best achievement in costume design, Catherine Martin, who's already got four Oscars for uh, similar awards, also a producer on this film, Boslerman's wife, I might add. Um, she's up for best costume design. Okay, can accept that. Best achievement in film editing. Okay. And the last one, of course, Catherine Martin's in on this one too. Best achievement in production design. So as you notice, yeah. not nominated for screenplay. Yeah. Yep. So we're sitting here bashing <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, the writing. And and for rightfully so, we're sitting. We obviously we got a lot of problems with the script, and we're obviously not the only ones, right? right because right. it did not get nominated for screenplay, and that's a telling thing for a movie to have eight Oscar nominations, a front runner for best picture and best actor, and it can't get a writing nomination. I mean, uh, what does that remind you of? Uh, I'll I'll tell you what it reminds me of. Remember Titanic, which had a flood of nominations, including. Uh, Kate Winslet for Best Actress and, of course, Best Picture and Best Director. Right. Couldn't score a writing nomination. Why? Because the writing sucked in that movie. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's a great spectacle film, but the writing sucked. And that's, that's you know, so I feel like we're, we're having the, kind of the same thing here. Um, but I'm happy with just about all its other no- – I'm happy with all of his other nominations. Yeah, me too. Um, and I, I got to tell you, like I said, I already said it once, but I'll say it again. A couple nights ago, I had Brendan Fraser in as best actor for The Whale. Mm-hmm. Um, we haven't really talked about The Whale in any of these podcasts yet. Moving film, sad film, and he's fantastic. It's it's like a comeback performance for him. But <laughs> when I watched this film, I remember thinking, shit, man, we got a new best actor. Like, th- I mean, mm. I, he was amazing. Yeah. I really loved what he did. And it's not, see, I, I'm not going to use the word impersonation. First of all, actors hate it. <laughs> so I won't use it because to me, it wasn't an impersonation. It was sort of like an, an, an imagining of Elvis, mm. right? Um, it's it's his take as an actor. It was his take on the imagining of Elvis, and and I thought he nailed it. I mean, from from the real life footage I've always seen of Elvis, uh, again his peak was before my time. He died two years after I was born, so I never saw him live. But <laughs> I a lot of footage that I saw, and I've seen movies that he was in. Mm-hmm. Uh, he just really had his mannerisms down. You yeah. Know? Yeah. The way he talked, the way he moved, I, I thought I thought all of that was fantastic, and uh, and you know it, it's worthy of the nominations. You ready to skip on over to uh, Mr. Cash? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's funny because I I thought we'd spend more time on on uh, Walk the Line because I like it infinitely greater than Elvis um, as a as a film. I just love Walk the Line. It's been like how many? What year did that come out? Because I remember seeing it at the theater on Thanksgiving weekend. I think two thousand five. Yeah, in Kalamazoo. And, <laughs> and Reese Witherspoon wins Best Actress. Um, it it was nominated, I believe, for Best Picture and Best Director. Did not win. That was the year. Um, that was oh man, that was the year people still regret to this day. Um, Brokeback Mountain won Best Director, Ang Lee, but Crash won Best Picture. Wow, yeah. Um, to bring things full circle, Brendan Fraser's in Crash. But anyway. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, and that was the one that nowadays, all these years later, when people look at uh, the big Oscar flubs, the mm. misses, mm-hmm. right, the the big mistakes, um, they always point to that year. They always say, Brokeback should have won Best Picture. Mm. You know, uh, Crash won Best Screenplay and Best Picture in it, and it, and it probably shouldn't have. I enjoyed Crash. I thought it was I thought it was a good film, um, but yeah, Brokeback is better now than it was then. If that makes any sense, mm. like when you watch it, when you watch it at the time, you watch this is an important film. This has a story to tell. It was so amazingly shot that they could just could not give it not give it Best Director, right? Mm. Like Ang Lee's 
directing was amazing. Uh, Walk the Line kind of got pushed aside because it was kind of a crash versus broke back kind of a year. Mm. Um, although Reese wins her Oscar for it. She won Best Actress for that film. Yeah. So it it did get recognized. And, of course, Joaquin Phoenix was nominated. He didn't win. He he doesn't get his Oscar until Joker. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but but he was phenomenal. And here's an interesting point of that. Both, both Reese Witherspoon and Joaquin Phoenix sang their own songs in the film. Yeah, that blew my mind. That is not uh, right. cuts of the real life singers cut right. into the movie. Like, they, like in Bohemian Rhapsody, where they kind of spliced together. Um, yeah. You know, uh, what's his name? God, I'm, I'm, the second beer is going to my head. Well, R- Rami Malek is R- the yeah, actor. Rami yeah, Malek. Yeah, that's what I was yeah, trying to remember. Rami yeah. Malek. Uh, they, they, if I remember correctly, they kind of synced his voice. Um, Right? Didn't they do that? Well, they, where they synced the the original the, that, recordings with he, his here, voice. But here's the thing. Here's where I'm going to defend Bohemian Rhapsody a little bit. Freddie Mercury had such a unique voice yeah. that you can't really duplicate it. Right? Like, like not to take anything away from Joaquin Phoenix, but Johnny Cash's voice, that gravelly sort of like, you know what I mean? Like. I suppose if I worked with a coach long enough, yeah. I might be able to sing. Yeah, jo- you, you know what I mean. You can like, find Johnny Cash's range, right? You, you can't find <laughs> no Freddie, Freddie Mercury's, Mercury's range. range was uh, was range was out of this world. Like right. you couldn't. I mean, uh, they even mentioned in the movie how he had two extra teeth when he was born. Like his that's why he's got that overbite. Yeah, and, and people told him to get those teeth removed so that his overbite would go away. And he's like, no, it's gonna fuck up my sound. Like <laughs> that, like that was how he got his voice. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's very very difficult to to mimic that. So I'm gonna give a little bit of love to Bohemian Rhapsody. I understand why. Yeah. Rami Malek couldn't exactly sing his own songs, but it is worth noting that both Reese Witherspoon and Joaquin Phoenix did the did the uh, the singing of the songs. Yeah, and they sounded the line. This, that soundtrack was phenomenal. I oh, it was great. So, it was oh, great. I forgot we, we were gonna talk about something before we jumped ahead, and I forgot the sound. Uh, so let's jump back oh, really quick. Best so sound. There was something going on with the sound that I noted that I forgot to mention, um, and it was I just remember in the beginning, like when Elvis started performing, and the and the girls were losing their minds. Right. So they did something with the sound during that scene, and I don't know if you remember it. But they they played it, what sounded like to me electric guitars, and that electric guitars that mimicked the shrieks of females. Okay, and uh, yeah. So go if you if you go back and listen to it, I was like, oh my god, the way they're doing this, it sounds like there's an electric guitar, like shrieking like those women were shrieking, but there were no electric guitars on stage. They were all playing acoustic guitars. Right. If I remember correctly. I mean, I could be I I could be wrong, but I remember thinking, oh my! God. So it was really cool, though. And there was another scene um, where they were they went back to Memphis, and um, like the the blues community and the the black community was all they were all he like uh, Elvis went back to to there and and he was going back, but they you could hear this the beat of like modern day rap playing. Which wouldn't have existed at that right. time. No, Did you remember that? Yes, that yes. was really cool. I was like, that was a great scene. Well, and, and you know what? Funny that reminded me of uh, again when Baz Luhrmann did uh, Moulin Rouge. Mm. Moulin Rouge was a period piece, but it was littered with films from with songs from our time. Yeah, <laughs> right. And it was like kind of in, like just infusing. Yeah. He did the same thing with Romeo and Juliet. This is a Shakespeare movie yeah. that sort of took place like almost present day in a world that isn't ours, right? Right. Sort of like a multiverse. And it's all current rock songs, like current songs. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, but he's the, great with the music. Unique I'll give thing, him that. The, that. Unique, the unique thing about Elvis, though, is when he did it with the Elvis's song on stage with the girls shrieking, mm-hmm. it showed the, the viewer 
where this new brand of music called rock and roll, where it was going to go with this shrieking of the electric guitar. Yeah. Also, where the blues was going to lead with hip hop. Yeah. It was really cool. I was like, wow, that really, it, it, yeah, it was really, it was subtle, but it was very noticeable to me. I'd have to, I'd have to look at the other nominees for Best Sound. I guarantee you All Quiet on the Western Front is probably nominated. Um, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. That I was a great movie. I wouldn't be surprised if Elvis wins. You know, uh, V, my wife, for those that are listening, my wife and I, we watched that like a couple weeks back. I don't know if I told you. All's Quiet? We, all quiet on the western yeah, front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we watched because it's on Netflix. So we uh, so we did watch that did in preparation watch for the Oscars. Did you watch it in German? Um, well, it it's yeah, it's in German. Yeah, well, um, you can watch it in English, but it's dubbed over in English. No, I think we watched the German version. Yeah, good. Um, I think. Is you know funny? what? I, I, I can't even tell it, you because yeah, it's done so well. <laughs> know, it just pulls you into the story, right? It was I'm pulled so in I can't even tell you what version we watched. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh yeah, no, I, I I enjoyed it very much. Um and I told uh, V, you know, my my wife, bless her heart, she's not big into movies. Yeah. And and I told her, I said, This is I said, this is the war equivalent to A Star is Born. It's a movie they remake every now and again. You know, there's, <laughs> yeah. been, there's been like three versions of it, you know, like every 40 years or so they remake it again. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, let's get back to Walk yeah, the Line walk here. Walk the Line. So infinitely better script. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Again, it was up for Best Picture, it didn't win up for Best Director. James Mangold wrote and directed the script. I love this guy, first of all. For anyone, I guarantee you've seen his films, you don't even realize it. He did Copland. He did Logan. Like, he's that. In fact, he was nominated for Logan. He did mm. Ford versus Ferrari. Like, he's done a, a lot. Of, yeah, yeah, he's done a lot of films that you probably didn't even realize were his. He did Walk the Line. I had seen it in the theater, but that was, you know, what is that, 20 years ago almost? 18 years ago? Long My time, God. Man. I know. 2005? So almost 20 years ago, about 18 years ago. So I don't really, I didn't really remember it. I had to revisit it for this podcast. Mm -hmm. So it was only the second time I'd seen it. And I remember when I saw it the first time I liked it, but I wasn't looking for screenwriting structure when I saw it 18 years ago. You know what I mean? I was just watching a movie in the theater. When I watched it this time, right off the bat, I wrote down the opening image. I wrote down opening image, Folsom Prison. He puts his thumb on the saw blade. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and. And I, I did obviously the first time I saw it, I didn't know the significance of that until later, right? right until right. until several scenes later. Now to go back and revisit, and you're like, oh, I was like, oh yeah, of course. And, and and right off the bat, you get this sense that this, see, this is the beauty in the screenwriting here, is it all ties back, right? Everything everything c- circles back. If you wanted to pick out a theme, the the best one I caught was when his brother has already had the accident and he's dying on the mm. on the hospital bed. He tells he he looks at Johnny, young Johnny Cash and he says, "Do you hear them angels? Do you hear, do you mm-hmm. hear them?" That to me is sort of uh it ties in a little bit to the tangible and spiritual goals because again with a beautifully written script, Johnny Cash what he wants, right? And what he needs are very similar but they're different. He mm-hmm. wants to marry June Carter. He mentions mm-hmm. it throughout the film. I've asked you to marry me 40 times. You keep saying no, right? Yeah, yeah. And he was infatuated with her when he was a little right, kid. Right, right. Because to her on the radio. She, right. She had the, the Carter family was a radio phenomenon, right? They they were radio celebrities. They did ra- radio yep. uh, songs. And he, so as a child, he was already like, I want to be like that. You know what I mean? And he says to his brother, yeah. I want to say he says to his brother, too before the accident when he's listening to him on the radio and the dad's screaming from the other room turn that radio off yeah. go to bed he says doesn't she sound like an angel right like mm. so so it all ties into what he wants and what he what his spiritual goal the journey that he has to go on and mm-hmm. i didn't have to go far to to think about this he wants to marry her but his spiritual goal is he has to earn her love, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Where it's different to just take, right? You just take what yeah. you want, you know? Um, he can't take what he wants. 
she's too strong of a personality. He's tried several times. He's willing to <laughs> cheat on his wife several times in this movie to be with June Carter. And every time she spurns her advances, she does sleep with him. But she really, when it comes to marriage, she's like, no, no. Because why? He's a pill popper. He drinks. You know what I mean? Like, it, he's a yeah, mess. he's a yeah. mess. It's not until the end when he cleans himself up and he finally gets her out on the stage again for that last duet together. And he proposes to her on the stage, which, by the way, happened in real life. That's not one of those film dramatizations. He did ask her to marry him on stage. And mm-hmm. and at that point, when she looks at him, she realizes this is not the Johnny Cash that I liked but could mm-hmm. never be with because he was a drunk. This mm-hmm. is a different Johnny Cash. He has earned her love at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and, yeah. and, and again, it follows all the basic script structures. The first turning point is where he, he signs with Mr. Phillips, right? And... Uh, Sam Phillips, and he goes off on this tour, and he meets June Carter for the first time. That's the first turning point, because now he's in a whole new film, right? It's totally different right. from Act One. Act One was, um, I, you know, I'm a working man. I got out of the Air Force. I did. I served my country, and now I just want to write music, but I can't make money writing music and support my wife and kids, so I have to get a real job, and I hate it, and I sing songs on my porch. <laughs> With my with yep. my two mechanics <laughs> as as hmm. guys that are playing instruments. And she even says at one point, she's like, you don't have a band? She's like, it's you and two mechanics <laughs> who can't even <laughs> play songs. Um, that's what his wife, not June Carter, but that's what his wife tells him. So, you know, he, he goes through all this stuff, and, and there's a little bit of a double bump. And I'll tell you what the double bump is. This is actually a thing in screenwriting. It happens in Star Wars as well. Um it's not enough for one thing to happen to push the actor into act two. Sometimes mm. it's, it needs a second thing, right? So if you think about Star Wars, I'll give you an example. Uh, Obi-Wan and R2-D2 playing that video, playing the hologram of Princess Leia saying, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only help. And Obi-Wan says, hey, man, you got to come with me. We have an adventure to go on. That's not enough. Right. Luke says, I can't go with you. Are you nuts? I got shit to do. You know what I mean? Like, I, I can't yeah. do this. So he rejects it. The double bump is finding out that Uncle Owen and Aunt Brew are dead. Yeah, it's finding out he ain't got nothing to do anymore. Right. At that point, he says, <laughs> well, shit, my chores are done. I guess I'll go with you now since I have no farm anymore. Right. So yeah. so th- it takes a second bump. And. Uh, and it kind of happens in Walk the Line as well because he meets Sam Phillips, right? And you would think that that's it. But just meeting Sam Phillips and trying to play songs for him isn't enough because Sam Phillips says, he even tells him, you're not, you're not going to make it on just this gospel stuff, right? You got, you got, mm-hmm. you got to, you got to sing from your heart. You got to, you got to. You know, er, again, you you gotta right. earn it, and that's the theme throughout the thing. It's earning June Carter's love, and it's earning the audience. Because in the beginning, he's not mm. earning it, right? He's just trying to do it, but he's not singing from the heart. He's not earning audience love yet. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so, uh, so the double bump is uh, meeting Sam Phillips and 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 playing for him isn't enough. He's got to get catapult truly. He's got to meet June Carter, and he meets her in person, and that's and that's where it starts, and that's where Elvis comes in, which is interesting because they mention yeah. it in Walk the Line, they don't mention it in Elvis at all, but they mention it in Walk the Line that he's there, he's there with them yeah. on this the Sam Phillips tour. Um, the midpoint scene is interesting um, because it, it's there's a couple of scenes right in the middle of the film that you would think. What do we always say? The midpoint, you get what you want, but you don't really because yeah. it all falls apart, right? Yeah, and it was at what the music awards. Uh, was that was that? No, it I or? actually had before that. It's their first duet together, where oh, he gets yeah, her out yeah. and says, "We're going to do times of wasted," and she's like, "That's the song I do with my ex husband," and he's like, "No, no, no, we're going to do it right now." June, just sing. So they start singing. He's got what he wanted, right? Or at least he thought he did. I got June, right? I got her out here. She's duetting with me, which is all, you know, he wanted since he was a child. 
And what happens after that? Like, she even storms off the stage. It's a big fight, right? Yeah, he gets drunk. He gets drunk. And then, and then, uh, and then, yeah, the award show where he's such a dick, right? Like, <laughs> hey, June, right what, this is your third marriage now? You know what I mean? She's <laughs> like, what the fuck, you asshole? You know what I mean? And then he offers her a job <laughs> and she takes it. <laughs> like, you know, so, uh, so they go back to doing the duet thing again. And I'll note that he wrote "Walk the Line" right in that somewhere around that midpoint scene. Well, because too, she's which is she says to him, yeah. she says to him, "You can't yeah. walk the line with me," and she right. walks off. And you yeah. know that that's actually a funny scene, by the way, when he's on the stage with all those guys, <laughs> and she starts chucking <laughs> beer bottles at them, and he's all, "We surrender, <laughs> we surrender." That's actually a funny scene because he's drunk off yeah. his ass. But but the whole second half. Is that downfall? Is that you know right. the 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 where everything goes to shit? He collapses on stage where he ODs. You know what I mean? They have to cancel the tour. Um, you know, there's there's all this shit. There's the oh my god. There's the the scene with his dad. You know, yeah. with the with the yeah. tractor and all that. Yep. Well, and the, so there's a couple things I wanted to point out that uh, one of the reasons I think I love this movie so much. Like you've already kind of laid out the, I guess, the textbook structure for writing a good screenplay. All these things are there, but it's layered, too. So, like, in the one of the opening scenes in the movie, um, uh, young Johnny Cash is talking to his brother, and um, he remember they're in bed, and he's, like, asking his brother why he's so yeah. good. Why so? Why are you so good? You know, because he and he's like, I, I can, you know, you memorize all the stories in scripture, and he's like, yeah, but you can sing. You, you know, all the hymns. You know, he's like, and he's comparing himself to his brother. Yeah. Though, oh yeah. In that in in that scene, and his brother said to him, "You can't help nobody if you can't tell them the right story," and that 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 stuck with me. I was like, okay, so like Johnny, he's that's gonna come to play later. Right. Um, because he goes to help prisoners right. and by telling the right so, stories, so right? He, so that's probably a better theme. I liked my Angels one, but that's actually probably a better <laughs> theme because that really ties into what I was going to get at, right? So he, mm-hmm. so you get to the end of, of Act 2. It's the all is lost is the detox, right? Like his, his mm-hmm. everybody walks out on him except June, which is interesting because this is a great line in the movie. And June's parents, June's right? parents, which is amazing how how <laughs> loving this family is, right? This guy is a fucking train wreck. Running off, running off drug dealers with a shotgun. Yeah. Mama had a shotgun, right. too. Right, like, like that, exactly. He's an absolute train wreck, but the Carter family brings him in. It's not just yeah. June. It's the whole family. It's like we're going to band together like we've always done, and we're going to take care of them. When they, yeah, that drug guy tries to come and sell him drugs. They chase him <laughs> off with a shotgun. But there's a great line when everything's going to shit, and he's trying to get the tractor st- out. So he's drunk off his ass, and the whole family's left. The dad's left. Everyone's mm-hmm. just leaving him, right? Like it's, this is the worst possible thing that could happen. And he, she says, they tell her, you got to go down there. And she goes, if I go down there, I'm not coming back. And the mother looks at her and goes, honey, you're already down there. Like, you know right. what I mean? Like, <laughs> he's already a part of you. You know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. you already care enough about him. So just right. help him because he needs your help. And, right. and he's not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. You know that. You're not going to get in this car and drive off with us. You want to stay because that's your nature to help him. Right. Yeah. Um, and then yes, dur- he goes through that insufferable detox, right? Which mm-hmm. which is you know you always see these detox moments in films, you know, where the guy's sweating like crazy and he's got to get all the chemicals out of his system, and, and it's like the worst point of anyone's life, I'm sure. Right? We've seen it in Clean and Sober. We've seen it in Basketball Diaries. The detox scenes are never good. They're never good. They're always the worst part of anyone's life. And then. As he's recovering now, right? He sees all mm-hmm. those letters. And what's yeah. interesting is that earlier in the film, the wife said, you see all those damn letters? They're all from chicks. So I want to throw their panties at you. You know what I mean? Which, by the way, in right. Elvis, the chicks were throwing their literal panties <laughs> at Elvis. And the one guy's like, is that a woman's undergarment I just saw? <laughs> 
So, right. so she's jealous because she thinks they're all from girls, right? When he actually starts to open these letters, and that is your jump to act three, right? right. Because he realizes now my place, my place yep. in the world. And the next shot, and I mean the next damn shot, which is so perfect, is he's walking into the recording, uh, the offices, and he's in all black, in black. with the black sunglasses. <laughs> he is now officially the man in black. And, and yep. he gets up there, and, and I love, and they said this earlier in the film, Actually, his wife said it to him, but they say it again here. It's almost like, uh, like uh, you look like you're going yeah. to a funeral. And he goes, "Maybe I am," <laughs> right? So he said that earlier, and then he says it again in that part. And then um, it's it's oh my god, the, the way it ends is so beautiful with the Folsom yeah. Prison and prison, and it's just like like I said, the real climax. Uh, the Folsom Prison is is kind of like where he fulfills his destiny in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's not until that very end scene where he gets June out on the stage and he proposes to her and she says yes. Yeah, the way he's yeah. holding her up after that, she like jumps kind of into his arms and he's holding her and there's like a still shot of that and then it does the epilogue where, you know, they they went on for another 35 years of right, being married right. and recording songs together. And yep. and then she died and he died 4 months later. You right. know what I mean? Like, yeah. I mean, there's two ways to look at it. You could say, I can't believe he cheated on his wife. I can't believe, you know, he was with his wife for so long when he really wanted to be with June Carter. But then you look at it and like, once he left his wife, they got divorced and he married June. They were together for 35 years. <laughs> like, yeah. you know what I mean? I know. I I remember the first time I saw it, I did feel bad for his wife because I was like, well, and she, she was, really, it sucks because she's, you know, she stuck with him for a long time. And she was tortured the whole time. Yeah, like. she was tortured. So it did, it sucked. But I mean, it is, it's reality. I mean, this, this was real life and it, it's what happened. And I just thought they did a great, I thought the movie did the whole story, just a beautiful bit of justice. And you, and you, you can know? argue that there's a, a, a little subplot there about trying to please his old man. His old man. Never. Yeah. His old man says at the beginning, God took the wrong son. Right. Right. When, I wrote when that it, down When his too, brother yeah. died. It was like, what? What a. The de- he said the devil did this. What a ho- he took the wrong son. Yeah, what son. a horrible yeah. thing to say to your kid. Right. Like, and right. he's just a dick of a dad. And even at the point where he's set, where he's sobered up at that big downfall with the tractor, that whole tractor scene, he tells him, he tells him, he says, I quit drinking a long time ago. I know who I am. You know what I mean? Like. Mm-hmm. I've right. made peace with myself. And he starts blasting his son right in front of everyone. He tells Johnny, he's like, you buy this big house, nothing in it. Right. You make all this money, nothing. You think you're a big shot, you're nothing. You know what I mean? Like, he just starts trat, And his dad's sober at this point, and he still is not getting his approval. And that's why the final scene closes the book on that one, where he's uh, the kids have the, the can with the string. And he's yeah, like, I don't yeah, know yeah. how to work this. And he goes, they want to talk to their grandpa. Talk to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and at that moment, you kind of get a sense that that him and the dad have have eased their pain, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there, there's a forgiveness there. And what I love what what Mangle does is he doesn't oversell it. There's no big hug it out moment with him and the dad, right? right. Because it's not it's not their movie. It's not their it's not their uh, journey that needs to be fixed. Right. So he just has that closing up scene and that's enough. Uh, Beautifully edited, beautifully acted. I can't even state that enough, how well acted it is. Um, Right. And, uh, you know, it's just a fantastic film. Came out in a a, a rough year. Like I said, when you you got to go up against Brokeback and, of course, Crash wins Best Picture, that's tough. Um, You know, it's hard to think what year would have been good for it. Maybe the year before. I don't know. But. Yeah, Walk the Line, I think, was a better... It's certainly a better written film than Elvis. um, And probably a better film all the way around. Um, But I would say so. But again, I wouldn't even be mad if Elvis wins a bunch of Oscars this year. Because the the movie (laughs) Elvis was fun. Baz Luhrmann... You know, I posted on Facebook that I was watching Elvis. And a buddy of mine posted... Because I I mentioned Baz Luhrmann in, in my post... And he commented, mm-hmm. a buddy of mine commented and said, oh, it's not a Boz Lerman type of film or something like that, or, or it doesn't feel like Boz. And I didn't respond because I was busy at the time, but, but I can respond now. I disagree. 
I think Baz Luhrmann is all over this film. All the things I love about mm. Baz Luhrmann is in this film. If you look at the damn poster, it looks like Moulin Rouge. Like it's, it's very much Baz Luhrmann, and, and yeah. that's what I love about it. I think they, they struggled greatly with the script, and I think, like I said, I don't know the ins and outs. It could have been the studio. It could have been just, you know, I don't, I don't know what happened. But when you have four different, five different writers spread out over four or five different writing credits. <clears throat> that's a problem that doesn't it, you yeah. know it doesn't it doesn't yeah. it, it shows that there's obviously something wasn't working right but yeah. the performances were great it was a spectacle of a film you know i might again i might watch it again tonight just because i love <laughs> i love uh austin butler's uh on stage performances you know uh, and I and I yeah. love watching those women when he is doing all his shit, and they are like th- losing it, like just absolutely <laughs> losing in their minds. Yeah. One girl yeah. jumps up and screams, and her I think it's her dad or her boyfriend, and somebody's like, "Sit down, sit down. What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> sit down." Like, just, and yeah, you know, right. and that's and that's the one part of Parker's dialogue uh, voiceover that's funny is that he's like, at that moment, I knew. He's like, <laughs> because yeah, I mean it's just uh, yeah. And so they're both great. Uh, Walk the Line is a great film. Elvis was a good film, very fun. Uh, I, I troubled script, but Walk the Line was beautifully written. Yeah. So yeah, again, I I can't even comment on the other movies that are up for best actor either. So I, I'm kind of with you. I I'll I'll be happy if it wins a bunch of awards. You know. But uh, I mean, I'm I'm like you though. I'm glad it's not, now. <laughs> it wasn't even nominated for. Now, one play, thing though. I was gonna say was is um, about biopics. We I mentioned earlier about biopics, writing biopics. Here's the thing about biopics, they they all kind of uh, there's a very similar theme you get with biopics, right? It's their beginning, how they started, mm-hmm. their rise, right? Their great rise, and then the fall, whatever it is. Bohemian Rhapsody had the same thing, right? He got too big, too famous, and then the downfall was all his, you know, partying and crazy lifestyle, uh, and the whole, you know, I'm the solo, you know, I'm a solo guy. Like you guys aren't nothing without me, you know. You you kind of get that mm-hmm. where a lot of these guys piss off their band right like so you so right. you get the how they started their rise their fall and then of course a redemption at the end biopics right. particularly with singers all kind of follow the same lineage right and these two films do their best to do that i just think uh you know i, I walk the line does it better as far as screenwriting structure um yeah. and you know I, I don't know i really loved reese witherspoon in this film too like it's yeah, you know, and if that's yeah. gonna segue, I believe you mentioned about a six degrees, where you wanted the wives, all right? So yeah, yeah. so the yeah, wives. So we're talking about June Carter, Cash, and mm-hmm. Priscilla Presley. But I can't, yes, and I don't remember what's the actress's name that plays Priscilla. Uh, Olivia De Jong. But I can't yeah. use the films, right? I can't use Walk the Line, right, and right, I can't right, right. use Elvis. So, yep. um, with the exception of Olivia De Jung, who hasn't had a lot of films under her belt, this is actually relatively easy. Um, she was in a film called Josie and Jack. Never seen it. Nobody has. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Olivia. Hard facts. Hard facts. Sorry. Nobody's seen it. But. Uh, William Fichtner is in it. And you know him. He's been in a lot of movies. He was in Heat. He was in, uh, uh, well, The Perfect Storm, which is the the link I'm going to, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, So he's in The Perfect Storm with Mark Wahlberg. Oh, yeah. Right? And uh, anyone listening right now probably already knows. They're already yelling it out. Mark Wahlberg famously was in a movie called Fear with Reese Witherspoon. Right. Who, of course, played June Carter. Well, that was easy. So that's only three connections. Yeah. yeah that, that, that's a, so Josie well, and Jack, Perfect Storm and Fear. That's three connections. Yeah. I knew Reese would probably make it easier for you. So, but Olivia was tough. Yeah. And and you know, no offense, Olivia, you got to get out there more. You got to. <laughs> well, yeah. She did a good job. She's in with Tom Hanks now. So, 
Yeah, yeah, she's in with that. Yeah, and again, right, I don't use the movies that we talk about. Yeah. Um, I did when we first started doing this podcast, right, a couple right. years ago. But now we kind of make that as a rule. I can't use the movies that we talk yeah. about. If I use Tom Hanks, I could probably be done a lot quicker. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so, yeah, so there's that. Um, anything else you want to add on this one? Not really. I, I, I mean, I just loved... I love this was a fun one because I I already when we mentioned it I love Walk the Line it's one of my favorite films, and uh, and I had watched Elvis even though I forgot that I fell asleep during it until I was rewatching it, <laughs> and I was like oh yeah so that kind of yeah it made sense when you started explaining your problems with it that maybe why I fell asleep but. But no, I think it was just I was tired because it is a good film, and I, I you know, I don't want to crap all over it just because I was tired, you know. But and, it did have its problems. Notably, Tom Hanks did not get a nomination mm. for Best Supporting Actor, and it, it it that's interesting because first of all, Tom Hanks gets nominated for everything, right? If Tom Hanks takes a beautiful dump, they're gonna <laughs> nominate him, right? He gets nominated for he's like the Meryl Streep, right? Right? Maybe he, like, he gets, maybe the Academy didn't want to uh, nominate two guys wearing fat suits. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave Brendan Fraser out of this, all right? <laughs> but, but but no, I th- I but here's what I was gonna say. What I was gonna get at was not gonna be about fat suits at all. What I was gonna say was um, Tom Hanks's performance is uh, it's almost confused. Yeah, like that's the word I'm gonna use. Like he, I think I could tell that even Tom Hanks as the actor. Had trouble trying to identify whose movie is this and what mm. role am I playing and what is my drive? You know what I mean? When you watch him in Castaway, yeah. just to just to name a movie, right? Like it, it, there's there's no mixed feelings or mixed emotions. And I'm not talking about oh well, Parker was the bad guy. That's why there's mixed emotions. I don't know. I'm talking about uh, motivation and actor's motivation. Right. Right. You you know. It, Castaway, Saving Private Ryan, even friggin' big. Like, there's no, you know what I mean? Like, he 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 knows who he is. Right. And he brings all the life out of those characters because he knows those characters like the back of his hand. I don't want to say Tom Hanks phoned this one in, but, but I got to imagine he read the various versions of the script and was like, man, this is some muddled shit I'm dealing with here. <laughs> right. Like, you know, and, and thankfully Boz on set was probably like, all right, you know what? Forget all those damn, you know, we got like four versions of the script. Let me just direct you and we'll yeah. try to get something out of this. Well, we've said it before. I mean, just look at Star Wars. You have some fantastic actors dealing with a horrible script. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> many, many well, I, 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 careful, careful, careful. <laughs> Dialogue. Don't, don't use horrible <laughs> script and Star Wars in the same sentence with horrible me. Horrible dialogue. I okay, say. so George is not a good dialogue writer. <laughs> I hate sand. That was his high point or low point, however you want to talk about it. <laughs> but anyway, yes, of course, uh, Anakin hates sand. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, is this say, it? Are we, we going to wrap it up? I say we bring this one in for a landing. I think we went over two or over an hour, anyways, but uh, that's okay. It's fun. We had a couple drinks. We talked movies. That's a good night. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Or morning, so you, whenever you're if, listening. If you if you haven't seen them, go see Walk the Line or revisit it. If you ha- if you haven't seen it or if you have seen it, but it's been so long, like me, I saw it opening week and I totally forgot. It's been 18 years and I forgot a lot about it. I enjoy going back and revisiting it. And right. check out Elvis. It is a fun movie, and yeah. I won't be mad if it wins a shitload of Oscars. I'm just glad it wasn't nominated for screenplay. I would also recommend watch it with someone who remembers when it happened. So watch Elvis. it with your mom or your grandma or somebody yeah. um, because it's fun. It was fun watching it today with mom because <laughs> she's like, she was cracking up watching those girls lose it over <laughs> Elvis. You know? She was one of them. She was one she... of them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Anyway, that's awesome. So that's my pro tip. Watch it with an old person. <laughs> uh, yeah. Exactly. Sorry, mom. Yeah. I called you old. <laughs> You're gonna hear about it. You're gonna hear about it. Yeah. Um, uh, as as uh, as we always do, uh, write us, 
let us know if you have thoughts. Uh, if you want to argue and complain and say, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Elvis was a wonderful script. Yeah. And, and please share this podcast with your movie loving friends, especially if you know they, they enjoyed uh, one of these two movies. So anyway, I think we uh, should call this a wrap. What do you say? I believe it. It is a wrap. Well, that's where we landed the plane on this one. I just want to thank you for listening. Uh, you can email us at silverscreenhappyhour at gmail.com. Just search Silver Screen Happy Hour on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. You'll be able to find us on those socials. And I just want to thank you again for listening. So please share this with your moving loving friends. And uh, until next time, I'm Chris Wiegand.